appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to share with you a preview of this exhibition. So as Sharon mentioned, I am Director of Education at the Museum of the Shenandoah Valley. I've been here, it will be three years in January, although time for at least the last year and a half has kind of been going like this for me. Don't know about you, um, but it's been an interesting time and I'm, I'm learning so much and I just love it here at this beautiful place where I get to come to work every day and um, experience great exhibitions such as this one. As I was, Sharon and I were chatting before we got started here, um, I love having our changing exhibition programs because I'm constantly learning something new with everyone that comes in and this one has been very, very um, instructive and eye-opening for me so far. And I think that the people who've come to visit it have had the same great experience. So um, this, this exhibition is a National Geographic's photo arc. And it features more than 40 large scale photographs of animals taken by photographer Joel Sartori. Um, he's been a photographer for National Geographic and many other publications for more than 30 years. And he embarked on his photo arc project in 2006. So Sartori says the goal of photo arc is simple, show what's at stake and get people to care while there's still time. Um, he's in the process of photographing every species currently in zoos and wildlife sanctuaries all over the world. Scientists predict that half of all species will be extinct by 2100. So Sartori is not only trying to get people to care about the animals, but he's also in the process of documenting them. If you think about the story of Noah and his ark trying to save the animals, um, Sartori with his photo arc is on the same mission. So far, he has photographed more than 11,000 species. And his current goal is um, up to about 20,000. He thinks this will take him a total of 25 years <laughs> to accomplish. Um, so definitely a lofty goal. We only have about 40 odd photos, but every single one of them is stunning. And um, you just can't even believe what you can see in these photos. So Sartori says, when we're able to look animals in the eye, it's easy to see they're not so different. And he really believes that that eye contact with the animals helps to create a connection um, between humans and the animals. So it's hard not to care when you look them in the eye and you notice in these photos that he really manages to um, sort of get that essence of the animal um, through his photographs. And this is a little, a little creature that we will look at a little more in depth later in the show. So here's a good example of Sartori creating that connection. If you take a good look at this mandrel, he's looking right back at us. Um, I looked at this with a group last week and everybody remarked on just how human um, the gesture that the mandrel is making here is. Is it like, oops, excuse me. Um, did he just pop a bite of something in his mouth? Or can you imagine he's about to blow you a kiss? Whatever he's doing, uh, Sartori just captures the moment and really draws you in and helps you connect with this animal. And now for something completely different. <laughs> this is a springbok mantis. Um, maybe you've never looked a mantis in the eye before. I know I never did until I saw this photograph, but even the most bug people among us have to admit there's something really charming about this colorful creature and his expressive head tilt. Um, and this is a good image to use to explore a little about the format that Joel Sartori uses. So you may have noticed that uh, the images we've looked at so far, all of them have a plain black background and the animal featured front and center. 
And Sartori actually takes a portable studio set up with him when he goes to photograph the animals. And he uses either a plain white or plain black background that allows the animal to really be the star of the show with no distractions. And that's what photo arc is all about. It's all about the animal and keeping the focus on our animals. The other thing that this format allows Sartori to do is to level the playing field for animals, whether they are big or small and cute and cuddly or not so much as in the case of <laughs> this mantis. Um, but, uh, you know, the reason for this is that Sartori believes that all species are worth saving. So it's easy for the cute and cuddly pandas and koalas to get a lot of press. The snakes and bugs and um, frogs are a little bit of a harder sell, but they're all equally important to the biodiversity of the planet and we need all of them to survive. So keep this little head tilt in mind as we look at our next slide, this beautiful Arctic fox. Um, this guy definitely falls into the cute and cuddly category, I think. I would love to take him home, except that it is a wild animal and not a domesticated <laughs> pet. So better to leave him where he is. Um, and if you have a dog at home, you've probably seen this expression before. Um, I also want to point out the information, the lower left-hand corner here, which gives us a little information about where the photo was taken and the species that's being captured here, as well as um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, assessment for the animals. So not all the animals in this show are endangered species. This one is of least concern and I've got a list here of how the International Union for the Conservation of Nature ranks animals. Um, to date, they have assessed 134,425 species, and they have found that over 35,000 species are threatened at this time. They are trying to assess what they believe is 160,000 species on Earth. Um, and you'll notice these designations throughout the exhibition. Um, so not evaluated, they haven't looked at the animal, data deficient, they don't have enough, um, they have not found enough animals in the wild to make uh, a category for that particular species. And then you move up through least concern, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, and then extinct. So Sartori's goal is to photograph all the species in zoos and wildlife sanctuaries. He's not trying to capture all 160,000 species that are believed to exist in the wild. But his own um, goal of 20,000 animals is still a pretty, pretty daunting task. So you see all kinds of different creatures in the show. Here is a fuzzy dwarf lionfish. I think the fish and the birds are some of the most amazing. Um, creatures that he has captured because they're so colorful and they're so beautiful sometimes it's hard to even believe that they're real. Um, this fish is of least concern, but if you look at the detail that Sartori captures here and the beautiful coloration of this fish, I think it's just super, super amazing, even though they're not like cute and cuddly like these guys. <laughs> these are just cuteness overload. Um, coyote pups. And I know no one's really a, super excited about seeing a coyote in their backyard necessarily, but here in puppy form, they are absolutely <clears throat> adorable and of, they're of least concern, but still very, very beautiful creatures. And so these are kind of cuteness overload, but here is some more cuteness overload. I know you all just went, ah, at home, didn't you? <laughs> You're muted, so I couldn't hear it, but I bet it happened. Um, who doesn't love a koala? So the government in Australia is actually in the process of reevaluating the status of koalas. They're currently listed as vulnerable by the IUCN, um, but there is a movement afoot to try to change that designation, at least in Australia's federally endangered. 
The numbers of koalas have been dramatically reduced in several areas of Australia in recent years. They are being threatened by overdevelopment, which results in habitat loss. And as more houses are built and infringe upon koala habitat, um, it may surprise you that a big threat to koalas is actually dogs. So um, as people get closer and closer into those koala habitats, just the pet dogs are a big threat to koalas. And of course, you may remember that last year, um, Australia had terrible wildfires that destroyed vast amounts of habitat and killed thousands of koalas. So a lot of people believe they need in intervention at this time to help protect this species. And here's a little more information about Joel Sartori for you, the photographer. Um, he started the photo arc in 2006 after traveling extensively as a photographer for Nat Geo and the other publications listed here. He was at, at home base for an extended time in 2006 because his wife was undergoing breast cancer treatment. So he, he couldn't get out in the wild to photograph animals. So he went to his local zoo and started photographing animals and the photo arc was born. Um, there's a lot of information on the National Geographic photo arc website about Joel and his project and um, information about a lot of the animals and ongoing updates about how many he has captured on film so far. So I encourage you to um, visit there. They have a lot of learning materials available also, but um, check out that website sometime if you wanna learn more about Joel and his project. So here's photo arc by the numbers, as I mentioned, started in 2006, over 11,000 animals photographed so far. It's just mind boggling. Um, and he has traveled to over 50 countries so far to photograph these animals. And this was uh, a couple slides here that were provided with the exhibition um, from the National Geographic people. And I was really surprised by the statement that habitat destruction and climate change are expected to wipe out half of all species by the turn of the century. That is 79 years from now just mind boggling. And here's why it matters because biodiversity produces the food we eat and the air we breathe, cleans our water, limits the spread of disease and maintains the climate. So the answer is when, we're, when we save biodiversity, we're actually saving ourselves. Um, when one species goes, it takes other species with it. None of us live in a vacuum or uniquely here on earth and humans are as dependent on other species and biodiversity as any other um, species is just for our basic survival. So we need to care. And um, I'm gonna show you some of the pictures in the exhibit that uh, Joel Sartori intends for you to care. Now, the slides I'm gonna show you will not do these pictures justice. As you can see in this picture, I put this in here just so you get an idea of the scale of these photographs. Um, these larger ones are five feet by four feet in dimension. And here you see our um, director of exhibitions, Corey Garman, and our registrar, Lauren Fleming, in the installation of the show. So I just wanna put, put our Arctic Fox in here so you have some, some idea of the scale of these these pictures. Here are some little blue penguin chicks. Um, these are from my hometown zoo in Cincinnati, Ohio. I spent a lot of time at this zoo when my kids were little and a good bit of that was spent in the penguin exhibit there. So I can tell you not only are they cute, they're also a little bit on the stinky side. And speaking of Cincinnati, you know, our football team is the Cincinnati Bengal Tigers. Um, I don't have a Bengal Tiger here, but I've got a Malayan Tiger. Um, and Sartori does a great job with this one, doesn't he, making that connection with the animal. He's looking right at us, and he's even got a paw lifted as if he's about to, to want to shake hands. And then we have this weeper capuchin. And this is one of the few photos in the show that does not show the animal's eyes. 
but I think we still make a really strong human connection with this, with this photo because of this very um, human-like posture that the weeper capuchin has here. Um, and by the way, they're not called weepers because they make this pose, but because of the sound that they make. They have sort of a little mournful sound that they make sometimes. And I think one of the things that really helps us make that human connection with this photo is the hand of this animal. I've had so many people say, wow, look at that manicure. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But yeah, it's, it's very, very human-like and such an emotional pose. I think it's really um, strikes a chord with a lot of viewers. And here we have the world's cutest smiling turtle. Never seen anything like that. It's just a great, great picture with this little guy looking out at us. And here is a beautiful Syrian bear. Sharon and I were talking about bears a little bit earlier. This is about as close as I have ever been to a bear or ever want to get to a bear, but he's so beautiful. You just, it looks like you could just reach out and boop him on the <laughs> nose or um, give him a hug or pet him, but don't because um, they're big. Uh, but this is just a great, great picture. This, I mean, he almost doesn't look real to me. Gorgeous animal. And that's one of the bigger ones. But then we also have little things like this four-turd gerboa. Um, I'd like to pet him too. Look at that beautiful fur. Um, there isn't a status, an IUCN status listed on this or toad gerboa because they are data deficient. So they don't have enough information about them to give them a designation. Um, they're native to Egypt and Eastern Libya and they have a very limited habitat range. Um, these are little nocturnal rodents, but just as cute as can be. And in this format that Sartori uses, he's just as big and important as that Syrian bear that we just saw. As I mentioned before, I think the birds are some of the most beautiful. Um, again, these guys are not making eye contact with us. I don't know how Sartori captured them both with their eyes closed at the same time, but these beautiful colorations of the feathers here are just really, really remarkable. And then we have this guy. The Safaka, who I just, there's something about him I just would really like to take him home. Doesn't he look like he's um, wants to say, hey, what's up? Have a conversation, ask you how your day was. <laughs> so some of the species in the show are endangered. Um, I have a few of them here for you and also some that are making a comeback. This is one of my favorite pictures in the show. Um, we have Aurora here. She is the baby with her adoptive mother, Cheyenne. Um, when Aurora was born, her mother showed no interest in her in taking care of her. So Aurora was raised by the zookeepers and about 50 volunteers who um, monitored her around the clock. And when she was several months old, Cheyenne made an overture um, and adopted Aurora as her foster baby. This is Cheyenne's fourth foster baby now. So she has, she has a lot of experience in the mothering department. She is 48 years old and Aurora is nine years old now. This beautiful brown-eyed fox is a Santa Catalina Island fox. And they are a descendant of the gray fox that lives only on Santa Catalina Island in Southern California. Um, they're pretty small. Adults only weigh about four to six pounds. But in 1999, their population dropped from around 1,300 down to 100. And this was due to illness. They caught canine distemper. Thanks to some captive breeding programs, um, vaccination and population monitoring, they're back up to around 1800. So they have moved up from endangered to threatened now. And Sartori notes that um, 
Zoos get a bad rap sometimes. People have problems with animals in captivity, but he knows that without these captive breeding programs, um, we'd be in a lot more trouble with a lot more species than we are. I think this is just a remarkable picture. I'll give you a moment just to, just to take a look at this northern white rhinoceros. A little bit different mood here with this animal. And sadly, um, the rhino pictured here died about eight days after the photo was taken. There are now only two northern white rhinos left in the world. They are both females. I believe it's a mother and a daughter. And neither of them are able to breed. So um, Sharon referenced earlier when we were chatting the frozen zoo, um, scientists were able to collect material from um, male and female northern white rhinos, and they have some frozen embryos. And one of the best only hopes is to use a southern white rhinoceros as a surrogate mother um, if they're able to pull that off. So interestingly, southern white rhinos are not endangered species. There are about 20,000 of them living in the wild. But the northern white rhinoceros was hunted for its um, ivory tusks and animal sanctuaries for them have been in unstable um, political environments um, where they lost quite a few because of warfare. So the future of these animals is um, very much um, unknown at this moment. And just because that was pretty heavy, I decided to put these lemurs back in here. <laughs> they are not endangered. They are vulnerable though. And um, what's interesting about this species is that the male is the only one that has that shows with the white fur around the face. So you see the female in the background there um, that has just all gray fur. And these animals live in what remains of the rainforest in Madagascar. They're listed as vulnerable um, because of habitat loss due to deforestation and also due to hunting. Here we have a Philippine crocodile that's critically endangered. Um, they have been threatened by habitat loss and hunting, and it's estimated that there are only about 100 of them left in the wild. So I've never thought of crocodiles as cute and cuddly. I've always wanted to avoid them as much as possible. Um, but again, really important animal to um, food web and biodiversity. They tend to be at the top of the food chain. And um, if you lose the crocodiles at the top, it throws everything else out of whack as well. So also not cute and cuddly is this little guy. Um, I had no idea what it was when I first saw this picture. Um, critically endangered axolotls. Uh, I think he just has the cutest smile though, doesn't he? It's just like, <laughs> he's giving us a side eye. He's really grown on me. Um, an axolotl is a type of salamander and they live only in a small area of Mexico near Mexico City. They're really um, important and unique. They live their whole lives in water, which is not like other salamanders. And they keep some of their larval features for their entire lifespan. So if you notice these really unusual, like frilly gills that they have, the fringy gills here, um, they also have a dorsal fin that runs down the length of their, their spine. Um, those are unusual features. The other interesting thing about them is that they have the ability to regenerate limbs. So they are very interesting to researchers. Um, there have been captive breeding programs that are underway and they are reintroducing axolotls to the wild. Uh, habitat loss, pollution, um, and hunting have all threatened the axolotl. They are considered what is it? Roasted axolotl, I believe, is considered um, a delicacy in Mexico. So we need to protect this important animal. And then we have some animals that have gone past the point of no return, unfortunately. 
uh, the dusky seaside sparrow. This is the last one um, who died in 1987. His nickname was Orange. Um, the habitat, these were uh, native to Florida and their habitat was destroyed by development. And then there was a wildfire in the 1970s that wiped out a large number of them. So these have not been seen in the wild and this was believed to have been the last one. We have Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog, also critically endangered, probably extinct. This is the last one that was known. His name was Tuffy because he hung in there for a really long time. Um, amphibians are particularly vulnerable to pesticides and pollution and habitat loss, but they're you know, sort of a bellwether species that uh, we need to pay careful attention to. Chucky Mad Tom is a type of little catfish and they have not been seen in the wild. And then this beautiful little creature, um, this is Bryn. She was the last known Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit, the last full bred um, of, her, of her kind. They have crossbred before they all passed. Um, conservation successfully bred the Columbia River Basin Pygmy with another breed of pygmy rabbit. So there is still some, some form out there. They've had captive breeding programs that have been successful. Reintroduction to the wild was uh, pretty touch and go for a while. They've, they've sorted out some things, but these are tiny little rabbits that like fit in the palm of your hand. I mean, they really are pygmy rabbits. So you can imagine um, the lot of predators out there for an animal this size. Um, but after some initial challenges, they've got some things sorted out and they're doing much better with reintroducing this, the new high, newer hybrid um, pygmy rabbits to their habitats. And then we looked at this guy on our very first slide. This is a um, federally endangered Florida panther. We believe that there are only about 130 of them left in the wild. So again, more, more protection, more help is needed, more intervention is needed for these animals. Um, also some success stories though, that was, that was all very heavy, but there's some, some success stories. The giant panda, for example, who doesn't love the adorable pandas. Um, some of my favorite things ever is every year when we have the first snow and the Washington Zoo puts out videos of the pandas rolling around and playing in the snow. They're just adorable creatures. And I'm happy to report that as of this July, the Chinese government has removed pandas from the endangered species list and they now list them as vulnerable. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, oops, changed the designation for pandas in 2016, also listing them as vulnerable. There are now about 1,800 pandas living in the wild, which is a strong rebound from their numbers in the year 2000, when there were only about 1,100 known to be living in the wild. There are also several hundred more in breeding programs and in zoos, um, but even though their numbers are coming back up, there are a lot of challenges for giant pandas, including the fact that the females are only fertile for about 24 to 36 hours per year. So a very, very narrow breeding window. And if they do successfully breed, you get a baby panda that's about the size of a stick of butter. So very, very vulnerable animals. Um, of course, they also live strictly on a bamboo diet, and um, even the bamboo is threatened by climate change. So their habitats um, and their breeding programs will continue to need intervention to maintain the species. Here's another animal that's making a comeback, the Mexican gray wolf. And the population of Mexican gray wolves has increased slowly but steadily over the last five years, thanks to breeding programs and conservation efforts. The most recent count, which was just conducted the end of last year, beginning of this year, I believe it was November 
concluded in January of 2021, found about 186 living in the wild now in New Mexico and Arizona. This is up from only seven, seven Mexican gray wolves in existence in 1977. There are approximately 350 more wolves who are in active breeding programs and facilities. Um, and they're, you know, trying to get a, a stronghold back in the wild here. So it's encouraging to know that if we take action, we can help save some of these species. And then we also have a section of behind the scenes um, photos and videos um, that show the process of that Joel Sartori goes through to get these amazing photographs. The video is really quite entertaining, but you'll have to come to the museum to see that. Um, but we have a couple of photos for you here. See there, here he's got his plain white background that he takes with him. And here's uh, just a camera lens with a chameleon. And this is another one of those animals that you just like blown away by the, the colors and everything about this creature. And just to share a few more of the animals in the show with you, we have the golden snub-nosed monkeys. This old guy is not too cuddly looking, <laughs> but it's an armadillo. Um, and if you look real closely, I don't, I hope you have a big enough screen that you can see this, but the, the shape of the scales on the armadillo are, there's all, they're almost like flower-like, which is just amazing. And did you know they had all that hair? Well, they're weird little toes, but <laughs> he's beautiful in his own way. Adorable chimpanzee, baby chimpanzee. I love this budget's frog who looks like he's singing. And then this really, really elegant, beautiful okapi. And then we wanted visitors to have an opportunity um, to reflect and to give them sort of a call to action. So we have this feedback board that we created in-house um, that asks visitors, what can you do to help? And we share some of the threats to species and causes. Um, and we just wanted people to, to you know, be thoughtful about this. Almost all of the threats to the species on the planet are caused by humans. Pollution, pesticides, habitat loss, climate change that is resulting in wildfires, extreme weather events, flooding, and rising sea levels. Uh, it's up to us to help protect all of the beautiful and the not so beautiful creatures on our shared planet. Um, I think, you know, we've seen some really, really great um, comments here on our feedback board. One of my favorites was written by someone small, if I'm to assume from their printing, but it says, um, do not bump into animals, even if big. So I think that's also good advice. And we have some programs related to the exhibition coming up that I wanted to share with you. Um, Teen Art Club Photo Arc. So we have a monthly club and it's not it's something you have to sign up for. Kids just drop in. Um, and strangely enough or wonderfully enough, uh, you know, teens can be a little challenging to get on board in any organizational effort. But our teen art club is about a, a little over a year old now, and it's really gaining some traction. Um, so we have monthly meetings, and this month they're going to be looking at photo arc. That happens this Thursday from 4.30 to 6. Um, kids can drop in or they can sign up on our website. So if you know a teen who might be interested, point them our way. And then on Sunday, at two, I will be giving a gallery talk in the exhibition. Um, I think we have a few spots left in the gallery talk so you can experience these, these um, images in, in full life, in real time. And then as part of our, we have a monthly lunch and learn um, series also that is held virtually. And this month we are gonna be featuring Deanna Orr from the Virginia Living Museum down in Newport News. 
And she's going to talk about animal conservation as it applies to Virginia in particular. So a little more bringing it a little closer to home here. Um, that's a virtual program. And then last but not least, you can take a workshop with a wonderful wildlife photographer named Sharon Fisher, who will be here at the museum, um, taking people out on our trails to see what they can see and learn, learn some tips for uh, shooting wildlife wherever you may be. So check us out at themsv.org. You can sign up for all those programs online there, or there's also a phone number to call where you can register if you prefer to do it that way. And that is the end of my slides. So if anybody has questions or comments, um, I'm happy to entertain them. Just Char, just if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for doing this. I was really happy to stumble across it. I had no idea this was at the museum and has always been a huge, huge favorite of mine. I have one of his books um, and just once you've seen it, you can't forget it. It is so captivating. Sure, I did. I forgot to mention the books. Here we are. It's a library program. Yes, there are. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that, Char. There are lots of um, books um, for different audiences that uh, Sartoria National Geographic have produced. So check those out too. We have some in our, uh, available in our shop here. Mary, yeah. I just wanted to say what a beautiful presentation you did. I cannot wait to come to the museum and see the, see the, the whole presentation. I mean, it was, you did a beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you so much. Thank you, thanks, I really appreciate that. And um, when you see it in person, it's just has that much more of an impact, it really does. Uh, and one of the things I really love about it is, you know, we talk about going to zoos, but um, which are wonderful, but here you get so close to the animal and it has such an impact. Um, I, I do hope you'll, you'll come out and see it in person. Absolutely, thank you. I'm really happy to know how to pronounce axolotl now. <laughs> I was, saw that, I was like, oh, how is that pronounced? <laughs> I had to look it up. <laughs> hey, good job. And like I said, I'm, yes, I'm, we're all here to learn. That is, I'm all about lifelong learning and I, I, I walk the walk and talk the talk. Yep, no, that was great. Yeah, you learn so much just from a single image from this. It just, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. You know, and, and sometimes as a photographer, I, I end up seeing things in an image sometimes that I didn't see in the field or something else, because our cameras are so good now in terms of, of capturing things that I go back and, and say, wow, I didn't even notice that the fine detail or as Mary was saying, uh, things, things that looked like um, flower shaped scales on, on the animals. And not everybody can travel, I, you know, to the first time I saw an elephant in the wild in Africa, I cried, you know, I just to see and experience a mountain gorilla with its young and then notice, as Mary was saying, these human attributes of um, one of my favorite gorilla pictures is of the gorilla picking his or her nose and then looking at it. <laughs> guess where that finger went right in the mouth <laughs> and that type of thing and then you learn that that you know they have all unique um fingerprints gorillas and you know how much connection and how precious these species are whether they're the big charismatic ones or you know even the little little things that you notice about the praying mantis. And yes, I, I have been on the ground taking pictures of praying mantis and they do have the best little expressions in their heads, you know, just being able to capture that and share it makes the them makes that next generation that's going to have to pick up and do the work that we're doing also um, connected to the to these animals and how important that connection is. So 
um, think of, of what we we can do with our photographs and, and getting getting people engaged in, in that because it is about being able to see and understand what that loss would be. Um, yeah, well, and I think this exhibition is really having that impact. I know it has on me, like I don't use plastic bags anymore. I'm trying to cut back on all of my plastic use um, and do reusable things. And I'm what I'm really struggling with right now is stepping on the spotted, spotted lantern flies. <laughs> I know they're an invasive species and we're supposed to to kill them and it's I'm I'm struggling. I can't do it either. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, I it see so Catherine's comment in the chat about Joel uses black or white backgrounds. It was unusual to see the stars in a night sky behind the Mexican yeah. gray fox. And we also notice it has like some little snow or something no. on it. Yeah. And that one looks like it was outside. Yeah, we're so we're trying to to get more information about that. We just haven't haven't tracked down the circumstances for that particular photo yet. But it's really really a beauty. And Missy's asking were they taken in raw? I I just looked up what his equipment was, and um, yes, he's he is doing processing. Uh, you, the depth and dynamic range of these pictures definitely were taken in in raw. Um, you just lose too much with the camera making the decision about how to compress the image. So definitely he and he is a Nikon shooter and I can, he's got a whole list of equipment that he takes out with him. It is far, it is far easier to have the, the animals in a captive environment where you can put up a, a studio around them. Um, they're also used to being handled a little bit. In the wild, what we try to do is we try to look for how do you isolate that animal so that you get that, the image of the eyes or something. And, um, you know, it, it depends on your comfort level. A lot, you know, a lot of wildlife photographers use really long lenses to get that, that close to the, to the big, more dangerous animals. Um, and then Mac, and then if you noticed, uh, Sally probably was looking when he was taking the insects, he, it looked like a, um, a macro lens that he had on the, on the smaller ones. But I can send for anybody that's interested, I can send his a link to all his technical paraphernalia. He, he does he does not travel light <laughs> so, um, to do these setups, but um, yeah. And every one of those pictures has such a wonderful backstory to it. And I appreciate that you shared some of those, uh, but every single one, it, it just, as if you couldn't already see it in the in the photos though, but it goes to show how much care he put into each one and how much each one mattered, which is the whole point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, like like the Arctic fox, like how he had to make the, the noise to get it to turn its head like that. And yeah, little things like that are so fun. Yeah. I, I think it's important to point out that zoo animals are going to behave differently than animals in the wild. Yep. They will uh, become um, used to humans uh, for good or ill. And that what I, I think we, it's important that we not anthropomorphize these animals and read into them more than what's really there scientifically. Uh, that um, uh, insect in this pose of, oh, the, um, uh, you know, he, he was actually defending himself. He's not looking at us in the eye. Right. Uh, so it's important that we we remember that um, the photographer was was dealing with captive animals who were used to human habituated to humans somewhat. Yeah. Very true. And, and that's a, a a thing as a wildlife photographer. I I really try not to. I know my presence affects wild animals. Period. You know. It, even the click of my camera can affect a hummingbird sometimes. Um, and so I know my presence taking pictures of wildlife that I wanna minimize my effect on, on the animals and have a real ethical way. And I was with 
a photographer in British Columbia and another photographer made a small noise to try to get the um, grizzly bear to look in a certain way, the brown bear. And this photographer said, we do not do that here, even to change the head angle. And so these are captive and they have a, they have a different intent in terms of really being able to show um, the vulnerability of these species. Um, and if you got a picture in the wild like this, a lot of times you're in a, a situation where you have to ask, did that photographer manipulate the environment to get that picture? Um, and is it, is it an ethically taken picture? So uh, yeah, you're absolutely right on the behavior. And that's nice that he has taken advantage of, of the fact that these animals already have some human contact and so that it's not as probably not as stressful for them. I know that he, he tries to create a really comfortable and not invasive in, invasive environment for him when he does the photography, but you know, how nice that he draws such attention to them. Other questions, comments? How long's the exhibit running for, Mary? Um, it is up until February 13th of 2022. Great. So plenty of time, plenty of time to come back and enjoy it multiple times. And see something different with each visit. I'm sorry to keep talking, but I absolutely love Samuel's library and I love the, the museum. So this was really nice collaboration. Do you guys do this often? We're planning another program, um, a little bit different. It's um, a, a book program on um, called Cousins and it's about the Kilby cousins um, from our local area. I don't know if okay. people, know the, the story about the Kilby family here, that um, they're, they're some of the, the original African-American settlers in the area, and they were not able to go to school um, in Warren County in high school. And in this particular book, um, they found, uh, one of the cousins found another cousin relative that was not African American and they've written about that experience together. And we'll be doing that program in November with, with the museum because it's going to kick off another exhibit that's coming um, this winter, which is a civil rights photography exhibit. So this was a, a good way to start, uh, start that, that program. And so when that program also comes in too, we, we might be doing a, another joint program, but I like doing the joint programs because we're, we're both really, uh, I think, important institutions in, in the Valley and promoting um, literature and art and uh, different types of things. So any suggestions you have for programs, please contact me. Everybody has my email because I sent out the link. Um, and we're really open for su suggestions on how we can expand our adult programming. Um, please, please let, let us know if you have suggestions. Oh, how nice. Uh, the Taste for Books program is phenomenal. Yeah. I yeah. just absolutely love that. I was so sad that it had to be postponed, but I, I understand completely. But look, look forward to that uh, coming back as well. If nobody knows about that, definitely look it up. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you so much for, for that. So other questions, comments? Mary, thank you so much. I, thank I you really so much for having me. I absolutely love what you said and endorse anytime we can work together. Um, I think that's great, a lot to share. And thank you all for, for coming, for joining the program tonight. Hope to see you.